But, oh, there we go. We're going to talk about the uh, Tash, Cache Toolkit API, which is another project that I'm undertaking um, to improve the development process for Traffic Server. Um, this is me. I've done stuff. Yay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, the basic outline of the talk is we're going to talk about the current cache and its API and how that works. Um, I'm going to describe my Toolkit API, the upgrade that we're going to do. Uh, and then we're going to again get to practice. I really like to validate my designs against actual practice to make sure that we're delivering value to the developers out there. Okay, what do we have now? That's a good question. So I'm going to completely destroy uh, Phil's talk by talking about the cache structure here. So um, we have a bunch of different things that go into the cache. We start with cache spans. A cache span is just a chunk of storage that we have out there. And so that's described in the storage.config file. And for most cases, it's going to be a physical disk. I'm going to say, here's a disk. It's this many bytes long. That's a, a storage span out there. Um, then we have cache volume, which are administrative units of cache. So this is what you actually configure. You go into volume.config, and you say, I've got these volumes. Um, and that's what the generally how you interact with the cache from administrative or uh, API point of view. Then a the new term I've invented called the cache stripe in order to describe this thing. And that's the intersection of a cache span and a cache volume. And you're all saying, well, what the heck does he mean by that? If I had, ah, there we go. This is what I mean. So what happens is, here's two spans out here. Span one and span two. We'll assume these are two disk drives out there somewhere. And we've def defined three volumes. Volume one, volume two, and volume three. What ATS will do by default, it will spread each of those volumes across all the spans. Okay, so if we had another span out here, it also would have one, two, and three on it. And so this blue thing right here is what we call a stripe. So this is a cache stripe here. So there's six stripes here. There's three volumes and two spans. Okay, and this is actually important to know when we talk about the cache. There's between a, a, a span, a stripe, and a volume. Okay, um, that any any questions on that? All right. So let's talk about Stripe. Stripe is important because these are internal base storage. When a traffic server goes out and interacts with the cache, fundamentally it interacts with Stripes. Um, every Stripe has its own directory of objects. So every Stripe has an independent directory of what objects are in that Stripe. Um, the object storage is a circular buffer per Stripe. So when it's doing that circularity, it circles around per Stripe. And every object that is stored in the cache is stored on a stripe. Objects are never split across stripes. Okay, so the, the stripe is really the, the independent unit of cache storage that traffic server deals with. That's why it's an important concept to have here. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about stripe assignment. This is a, a, a big deal. So we said that we're storing objects, and we're storing each object out on some particular stripe. Well, which stripe? Okay. We call that, just figuring that out is what we call stripe assignment. Um, and there's two phases for this. First, when we're doing the right object, obviously, we pick a stripe, and we say we're going to write the object out to the stripe. But then we have to figure out where it was later when someone asked for it. So obviously, these need to be consistent. Um, so. When we talk about Stripe, I'm going to talk about Stripe assignment on and on. And so this is what I'm talking about here, figuring out which Stripes. Um, so part of that is when we have an object, each object has, gets a cache key. Okay, and this is currently it, it has to be URL formatted. We're looking to make it just a string because really that's internally what it, how it's actually used. And by default, we use the URL for the object. And so that becomes the cache key. Now what we do is we hash those and we create a crash ID. So this is a fixed size, 128-bit value that is the hash of the cache key. And this is really how we talk about objects in the ATS cache. Um, everything is, it's all fundamentally uh, driven by this cache ID here. And so that's how we locate things in a Stripe directory. And you're saying, yeah, in a Stripe directory, what, which Stripe directory? Well, that's the fun part. Stripe assignment is completely independent of this. We can have the same cache ID um, in different stripes depending on how we do the assignment. Okay, so this is not used in, in Stripe assignment at all. This is done after we've picked the stripe, we compute this. Um, 
So one of the issue, one of the benefits here is that this is uh, designed for robustness. So if a drive, if a span goes down, drive fails, we're not saying, well, things that would go to that stripe are now we simply can't cache them or do anything with them. So that's a big reason this has to be independent. Um, so because of the way the, the traffic server cache is structured, uh, cache misses are usually fast, um, no I.O. because we have an in-memory um, index. Um, because they're circular buffers, we can get objects booted out of the cache before they officially expire. Right? So if you have a wrap and it goes around and it blows away other objects, those objects are effectively evicted from the cache. Uh, even though there's still um, directory entries pointing up. However, on the flip side, we have no fragmentation or garbage collection issues, right? It's just a circular buffer. Um, no garbage collection, no fragmentation, none of that kind of stuff. And so it doesn't really have a concept of full or empty in terms of storage because the behavior isn't any different from a brand new fresh cache or one that's been wrapped around 50 times. It, it interact, the ATS interacts with that stripe in exactly the same way in all those conditions. And this is a key point which actually took me a while to grasp. No data is ever updated in the cache. That if, if you see stuff claiming that, they're just being, uh, helping you understand a little bit. It, it's only written. So if you have a object and you get a refresh, a 304 on it, it doesn't update that data. It copies it into memory, sees that it's a 304, and then writes a new copy out to the cache, out to the stripe. Okay. Does it? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. I'll, I, I'll exp ask again later. I'll have more diagrams where it's easier to explain how that works. Um, so this is a fundamental issue that we don't update things, right? So we don't have to go back. We don't have to worry about the circular buffer because we never go back and update any of that stuff. Now we're going to talk about fragments. So we can store very large objects in the traffic server cache, but you don't want to be storing really huge things out there. So it fragments the, the objects that come in, and we call those fragments. Um, so when an object comes in, um, it's broken from fragments if it's particularly large. If it's less than the, the a target fragment size and it's just one fragment and it's just written out, we group those for write. If we have a bunch, of, a bunch of small objects, they're each in a fragment, but they're small fragments, and we group them up and do a one write for that. Um, but when we read an object back in, that's always done, a particular object is read back in. We don't read groups of objects back. Um, we have a, a structure called a doc, um, short for document, I guess. And this is uh, stored with each fragment, and this is basically the header data for that fragment. Okay, it's not the header data for the object. It's the header data for the fragment. So every fragment has a doc. Okay, um, the, the, the doc on the, that, that contains the object header is different, but that's just data uh, fields inside the doc. And so we have a bunch of metadata for each object, right? What was the request look like? What was the response look like? And a, a few other things that we want to keep track of. And that's stored in the first fragment we write out for that object. Okay, well, the first that, conceptually the first, where the, the, the data starts for that object. All of the metadata is in that first fragment. So once we read that first fragment, we know everything, all the metadata, the response, requests, all of that about the object. We may not have any data for it, because that may be in subsequent fragments. But we can do, make judgments about, is this the object we want? Um, should we cache it? Is it stale? All of that before we read any more of the object. Um, and every fragment has an entry in the directory. So it's not quite true that the directory points at objects. The, the Stripe directory points at fragments. Okay. And by default, to make things to make things easier, the, um, the cache ID for the first fragment of an object is the cache ID for that object. Okay, so we get the object, we compute its cache ID, therefore a, that means if it's stored, there's a fragment with that ID out there in the stripe that has the, that's the first fragment for that object and has all our metadata. If we look and we don't find it, then the object's not there. Um, okay, I don't understand if I can do that. So the target fragment size is a configuration value. It's about a megabyte. Um, and that's just a target. If it's smaller than that, um, it'll, it, it's still just a fragment. And it tends to, when it does it write out, it tends to group fragments up to that size and then write all those out. Um, you can change that. Um, 
one megabyte's a pretty good average. Uh, where you might want to change it if your object demographics are such that there's a nice cutoff. So like one client, their object demographics look like this in size. Right, they just did this huge spike. So they set their fragment size just past that spike. Right, and then you get fewer fragments out there. If, if, if you have kind of a flat curve, it's really not going to make a lot of difference. Um, Yeah. No, no, it rounds up a little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, so it rounds up to the disk sector as a minimum, and then the larger the object, the more granular the rounding. But for small objects, it um, rounds to the sector size, basically. So every read and write is on a sector boundary, disk sector boundary, which is 512 bytes normally, something like that. Okay. Um, so I have a picture. Um, so this is a Stripe directory. Let's see if I can actually point out the salient pieces here. Um, here's the Stripe directory. This is always memory resident. Every directory of every Stripe is memory resident. Um, oh, for people taking pictures, this is, I've uploaded all these slides. So um, Each Stripe is divided into two pieces of the directory, which we store on disk. So for, you know, because we have to restart, we don't want to throw away the directory every time cache every time we restart. But this is really just a backup. It writes it out there every so often so that when you restart the process, it can bring it back into memory successfully. And then there's the content area which we store the actual objects in. So each directory entry has a tag, an offset, and some other data, um, and a, an approximate size, which is the rounded up size. So when you, you find this entry here, you go out and you read off the disk at this offset and this size. And that's your, that's your first, fra that's your fragment. So these are aligned to this, these chunks here are aligned to disk sector size, and at the start of each fragment is your dock, and then you have some content and maybe a little bit of padding um, from the rounding. And then we have, this is just another directory that points to some other fragment there. And even this next fragment, of course, it's not adjacent to the directory because this is a big hash table. So that's how we get um, first fragments out of the cache. And now we're going to talk about large objects. Um, so, we, as I said, we store large objects in multiple fragments. There's a target maximum fragment size, so when the, you fill up that much data, it goes ahead and writes that fragment out. Um, so, this is a key point. Because we store every object in a stripe, the largest object you can store is limited by the stripe size, um, which may or may not be your disk size. Right? If we have two volumes, then each of those disks is going to be cut in half, and your actual maximum object size is half your disk size. Okay, that's why the stripe is, is important to understand that. So obviously it's less than the cache span size, right? So if, you're, if your physical disks you're using are, are, you know, 10 gigabytes, well, then you're not going to store 12 gigabyte objects in them. So if you put more disks on, you can store more objects, but you can't necessarily store bigger objects. Okay, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Although, I, yeah, I need to blow through this quickly because this is not what I'm, this isn't actually what I'm supposed to talk about. Um, but you can't understand the API unless you have some of this background stuff here. Multi-fragment object, so here's how we store multi-fragment object. You take the cache key for the object, it gives the cache ID, it gives us the first fragment here, which is stored over here. And then there's a chaining logic of the keys that tells us, well, once I know this one, I can figure out where the next directory entry is, which tells me where the stripe is, right? And then from that, I can figure out where the next directory entry is. So we, we, leave, we zip along through the different directory entries, each of which tells us where this fragment is out in the content area, okay? So someone asked a question about when we get a refresh, what do we do? Um, now, there's another term we're going to use called earliest stock, and this is the first fragment that has actual content in it, right? We talked about the metadata for an object, and there's content for the object, right? So the first stock is, is where the metadata is. The earliest stock is where the earliest content is. Okay. These can be the same. If you have a small object, the earliest and the first stock are going to be the same fragment. If you have a large object, that tends to migrate out to here so that there's a, a first stock with just metadata and then content starting here. So if we do a refresh on this object, we recopy this fragment, which contains only metadata. Okay. So that'll get rewritten out here somewhere for refresh data. There's actually a configuration option to say, well, if it's all in one um, fragment, 
and the object is less than this many bytes, copy the object too. So you can say, well, if it's less than 64K, then I don't want to do two seeks to go back and get it because I've done a refresh. Just copy the whole thing over. And that's configurable. Um, so as you refresh, this thing moves a lot. This is separated out like this so that if we, if we do a cache wrap, we're going to destroy the earliest stock first. So after we read this and we find the object and go to the earliest stock, we'll know whether we got the cache wrapped and destroyed that first. We won't, it won't, we won't find that out later after we've read several fragments and started serving it out to the client. That's why the earliest stock is, er, is actually written earliest on the stripe and the first stock is, is written last so that when this moves on, we've, we've bounded all of the other data by those two things. And of course, if it's, if it's all in the first, first stock, then, well, first fragment, then, then we're all cool. Okay, so I got to talk about alternates too. So uh, alternate, an object can have multiple stored different versions called alternate. This is usually for a very reason. Um, we call them alternates. Um, all, all the alternates of the object have the fir same first fragment because that's where all the metadata is, including the metadata about how many alternates you have. But they have distinct earliest stocks, earliest fragments. So each alternate has, so you read the, the first fragment, you get the metadata, you say, oh, I want this alternate. It says, well, it, its first fragment, its earliest fragment is here, and then you just start reading those and they chain up for you. That I, I, I can, yes, I'm not, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll talk about that later. There's a whole complex API for dealing with alternates. It's, yes, it's, it's, it's quite, yeah, it's, um, yeah I've, seen, I've seen some people do some very interesting things with, with the alternates. Um, you can actually make them vary and just, you can have plugins and make them vary on anything you want, really. So let's talk about the current API. So the current API is actually very limited. We can have some control of cache ability. Um, we can set cache keys um, if we want. We have uh, what we were just talking about. You can do alternate selection. So when the, the first fragment's read in, there's a hook to say, well, let's look at all the alternates in that and pick which one we like best. Um, otherwise, it'll use the default logic to do that. We have a limited ability to scan objects. Um, this is a per volume scan, and so it's not quite as useful as it might be, and it's, it scans everything, so it can have a real performance impact if you're not careful. Um, allegedly, you can get to the metadata for these objects, but as far as I can tell, that, it, that interface is not actually implemented. So you get these objects, you're scanning the objects, and you get them out of the cache, and that's just this pile of bytes. Um, okay. Um, and we have really no access to the cache data structures. You cannot, there's nothing in the API that represents a stripe. It just, there's just no such thing. So that makes dealing with stripes very difficult. And you really want to do with stripes because that's really your cache unit there. Okay. Um, and this was done because back in the day, um, nobody cared about the cache contents. It was all very soft. You just blow it away all the time. It was, just, it was designed just to run automatically and not be worried about. But people are now putting a lot of value into their cache. And so we have to, the traffic server has to change with the times, right? Um, so yeah, we talked about you can't interact with stripes, we can't look at the cache state very much. Um, the pieces that are there are frequently unstable and only partial input and, and certainly not documented. So um, we want to do better. I'm getting a lot of pressure. Uh, people are putting value into the cache. They want to look at their cache. They want to examine it. They want to know things about it. Um, so we want to we improve the API so that they can do that. So we're going to go with the toolkit API. Um, I call it the toolkit API. Well, actually, let's look at our motivation. So, we want to do this because the current API is really inadequate to the, the more sophisticated and divergent needs that people are putting Traffic Server to. Um, we're seeing a lot of vertical use of Traffic Server. Uh, Jan just gave a talk about their use of it. So what we're seeing is rather than Traffic Server being used as some generic ca cache proxy, it's becoming a critical component to a vertical stack of software that people are deploying in the field. And therefore, they want to use it in very particular ways. Um, so they want custom extensions, and we've been putting this into the cache, and that's, that's just not been working well because now we have all this really complex cache logic. And the cache is hard to understand to start with. And you start putting all this custom stuff in, and you just can't figure it out. So we also want to, we want to deal with that. We want to get better cleanliness and modularity. We'd like to, in, as much as possible, reuse the me same mechanism of the API internally, too, so we can, we can be more modular there. Um, Demotivation. So there's things we don't want to do. Um, 
So users, this is what we get from the users. Um, so we have uh, people using um, Traffic Server and they build some extension for it. And they'd like to release it to the community, but it's a, it's a huge hassle, right? Particularly if it's going in the core and you know, they've, they've made it work for their particular case, but then if you're gonna put it out there and contribute, it has to be a general case. And then you have to design that, you have to test that. Um, if you don't do that, then you get stuck porting these changes to every version, and that's not even, that's not any more pleasant. Um, you know, you have to publish the code, uh, and then you can get stuck, the legacy maintenance. You know, you put it out there, and then you move on to some new tech, but it's still out there, it's in the core, and you're stuck with it, who's gonna maintain that? Or you have to go out and hire people like me who are really expensive and obnoxious, and that's, that's, just, that's just a terrible place to be, okay? Um, so, so users don't want that. What we in the, the development group don't want is, we don't want to, you know, similarly, we don't want to have a huge code complexity that one user uses, right? Sometimes you can't avoid that, but you want to do that as little as possible. And we want to reduce configuration complexity. Our configs are already pretty complex. And we don't want to have, you know, impose general configuration complexity be, for, for one user, right? So we've been looking at this. We started, this was originally a tiered storage design with Phil Sorber. Thanks, Phil. Um, and we did this at the Denver Summit. Um, so we wanted just to do tiered storage, right? We say, well, we've got SSDs, we've got RAM, we've got rotational media. We want to store different things in different places. And we brought that out and discussed it, uh, presented it at the Yahoo Summit. Um, when was that? I don't even remember. It was somewhere someplace. Um, and everyone wanted different features for their tiers, and then they wanted different cache features, and um, okay, I just, since I made the mistake of learning how the cache worked, I got stuck with this. So this is why it's a toolkit API, because there were just too many different features that people wanted. We needed to build a general toolkit. And this was the consensus out of the summit, is that this is where we wanted to go with this, with our cache API in the future. So um, that was very helpful from the summit, so that I knew what what they wanted, and I could build something that the, the developer community would actually, well, have a chance of using. So, yeah, so that was my brilliant idea that would gen do this um, general, general toolkit thing. And of course, you know, I got a lot of positive feedback, except for the users who said, is it done yet? Um, so what are we gonna do? We wanna make the cache state, the data, and operations visible. I'm gonna say, we want to be able to look into the cache and say, well, what, what the heck is going on in there? Um, we want to override cache actions dynamically, not through a configuration file, but live when all the transactions going on to make a decision about what, do, what cache operations are we gonna do in this object. Um, we wanna be able to initiate cache actions, put stuff in the cache, remove stuff from the cache, move stuff in the round, do refresh stuff, to say, you know, autonomously, not from just user requests coming in, client requests coming into ATS, but for some other external reason, right? Um, so we wanna, most of all, provide the tools for the users to be able to do this on their own without having to do full-scale um, core-level development. I guess that's just, that's just my theme. So what are the key uh, facets of this? The first one is visibility. Um, I get requests, you know, people say I want, they want to optimize their cache I mean, help make their cache more efficient, but we have no idea what's going on in the cache. So that makes any sort of optimization rather challenging. So the first big thing we want to do is we want to get these internal structures out where we can have plugins, look at them, generate logging data, do inspection to say, well, what is actually happening out there? So we want to get out the, we want to get into the directories, the directory entries, we want to look at the volumes, the disks, and particularly the stripes, and say, well, what stripes do I have out there? You know, how are they behaving? Um, the style we're going to use is we're going to use opaque pointers with accessor functions. If anyone's used the current API, um, this is exactly how it works, right? You get a TX, HTTP TXN object back, and then you call functions on it to do things. So that was the consensus, is that we wanted to continue with that style, um, use iteration functions for search, so you pass it a continuation, you get callback per item. Um, and this is, this is useful by itself, um, and we have uh, use cases and users who want just this, but we also need this because none of the rest of the API makes sense unless you can see what you're working on, right? If you don't have a Stripe object, you can't do anything with the Stripe. So this is, our, this is our first target, get this stuff exposed, see what's in there, so that we can make the rest of the API work. Um, we wanna put hooks in. Um, this is how we do dynamic control. Um, we wanna put hooks in for various uh, cache events um, so you can watch stuff happen. Um, we're having uh, disk fails, a big thing that's getting pushed on me now. You know, the disk fails and what do we do? How do we handle that? I want alerts, I wanna do stuff. 
Um, life cycle events, cash comes up, cash comes down, cash gets initialized, cash gets reset, all of that. Um, we want to look at object events, of course. You know, I got a directory misc, I got a disk miss. Um, something was evacuated, something was deleted. Um, one of the things we're going to be looking at is whether we want to do a, a special case statistic hook. There's a lot of, for visibility, people don't say, I don't want to interact with it dynamically. I just want a counter that gets bumped when this thing happened. Okay, like, you know, the, the cache, um, the disk failed, the, the cache wrapped, the stripe wrapped. Um, so, you know, it might be useful, that may be common enough to say, well, you can just define this and we'll write the plugin for you and we'll just bump this counter for you every time that happens. Um, the biggest hook that we're going to look at is stripe assignment. There's stripe assignment again. This is a big, big deal for a lot of people. Um, so, let's talk about it. All right. Luckily, I have a slide here right after that. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so Stripe assignment controls accessibility and storage for objects. We talked about the importance of Stripe assignment early on, and so we really want to get into um, that logic and have plugins that can control it and influence it. Because okay? you can do just a whole lot of really good things once you can do that. Um, so, what we're going to look at here is we wanted to be able to do parallel writes. That's a specific use case that people want. They want, to, um, they want to say, I want to write this thing to multiple stripes at the same time. I'll get into some reasons why you'd want to do that later. But that, that's something we want to do. Um, parallel searches is another big one that people want. I want to say, I want to be able to look for this thing on multiple stripes at the same time um, to see which one comes in faster or because I'm not really sure which stripe it was on. Um, so we're going to do that. We're going to talk about how this works later. Um, this is another, all of these were really big user requests. It's retry optimus read. I go out and I read, and it doesn't work. And so I want to try something different. I don't want to just give up. Um, let's let you um, both search different stripes for the object, and also let you do alternate key searches. Suppose you say, well, it might have been stored at this key or that key. So I didn't find it on the first key. Let's try a different key. Okay, and we want to initiate cache operations. This is really a, a tertiary, uh, secondary thing. Um, this is nice. Um, it's not quite as critical as the other stuff. So we, there's people who need to be able to copy objects from stripe A to stripe B. I think they should just do parallel writes to start with, but, you know, I'm just a developer. I just have to do what the users tell me. Um, and this makes it, um, so it's more efficient than that. Um, we want to get in and we want to probe and delete directory entries. That lets us control what's, on, what's effect, effectively in the cache. Uh, there's a thing called evacuation where if the, the right cursor is coming up on an object that's currently in use, you don't want to overwrite it while it's in use so it gets evacuated, i.e. that is copied um, into uh, past the right cursor so that it doesn't get blown up. You'd like to be able to uh, both mark that yourself to pick objects to get evacuated and watch that happening. Um, we'd like to be able to read and write cache objects to just say, oh, I don't have a, a client request. I just want to go into the cache, find this object, and I want to just stream it out to some plugin and do something else with the data. Or I've got some other source and I want to just stuff that thing into the cache. Okay, people want to do that. Uh, and control the alternates, get a finer grain, control the alternates. That's not too bad, but with, what I'd like to do is replace the current one for something that's better integrated into this. Okay. So, reading from the cache is the big um, thing that we spend a lot of time looking into design, trying to figure out how to make this work in some way that's both understandable and useful, and that's a, that was a very narrow overlap. So client request comes in, and we do a cache probe. The core does a cache probe, and it, so it initiates uh, a cache read first doc, and the plugin gets in at this point, so it can influence how it reads the first doc there, first fragment. I'm sorry, I should say first fragment, not first doc, because that's different. So. Um, that read can complete, and then you wait for the read, and in here you can initiate additional read operations. Um, and then each of those that comes, gets, comes back here. So this you can do, this lets you do both parallel reads, so you can just initiate, initiate, initiate out of here, and then wait for the completes to come back. Or you can wait for a complete and then send a read out. Because it was important, it was, it was made clear it was important to both be able to do parallel reads and serial and sequential reads, which is the read retry. So this gives you both of those. Um, and we want to report success in that we found it, 
um, we, we didn't find it in the directory or we went out to the store and, and it wasn't actually out on the disk, even though the directory entry was there. Eventually, we, um, you do a read accept and you say, okay, this particular read, that's the one I want to accept. That's the object I want. And then you cancel the other ones. Um, okay, so some miscellaneous things we want to do. Um, one of the things I'd really like to do, this is, seems kind of a trivial thing, but I think it'd be very handy, is to be able to go out into the storage and volume configuration definitions and just be able to slap, slap some key value pairs out on them. Okay, just say Bob equals Dave or whatever out there. And then the useful part is make these visible to the API. So now you can decorate your volumes and your spans and then find those same things when you're in your plugin. Right, so if you want to mark these are my SSDs, rather than doing complex stuff in your plugin about how do I detect this device with SSD, you could just put that key value pair out there and find that later, say, okay, this is my first tier, this is my second tier, et cetera. Um, general cache, cache key and ID control. This has been kind of a little controversial. I would like to integrate the RAM cache into this, so it's just another stripe. Um, what we may do is make that optional, so you can treat RAM as just another stripe if you want. Um, some people do like the, uh, the current RAM cache, so I may, we're probably going to end up leaving that in here. Uh, and I want to be clear that this is not much, we're not going to be changing much of the actual cache implementation for all of this. This is really an API update. Though, of course, we're going to have to make changes in the, in the cache logic. But it's... The what? Yes, that's one of the reasons some people don't want to give it up. But I have other users who say, no, I don't want to do any of that. I want control. I want tiered storage. I want control of what's in my RAM. And then, so they say, I, just, I don't want the, the current RAM cache. I just want a stripe that's just made out of RAM. Um, so. so let's talk about some use cases, um, what people would actually do. This is not just a cool PI. This is actually useful. I know, I see the disbelief in all your faces. Um, so as I said, the design was driven by use cases. I've had a lot of feedback from the community about things I want to do with the cache, um, things I want to implement, and I've tried to make sure the design was uh, sufficient to do these kind of things. So let's look at some of those things. Okay, we talked earlier about monitoring. Um, I have a very specific requirement for doing monitoring to watch the cache in operation, to generate logging data from cache operations. Um, one of the uses there is to do um, off, in effect, off-site log processing to see what, to have better idea what's in the cache. You generate log events, you ship those logs off, you do some analysis of them to figure out what's in your cache. That's for more people who have more stable caches. If you have rapidly evolving caches, it's not quite as useful. And from that, you can tell how much of my content is still valid. You know, what are my directory misses? We, we have no idea how many directory things, things come in. You get a directory miss versus a disk miss versus um, an overwrite miss. Um, that data simply doesn't exist. Now, we have to be careful because some of this we may decide to put direct statistics in. So, but what I expect is we'll do it, we'll put it in plugins and if it's generally useful, then we move it into the core. I don't want to just start slapping additional statistics into the core first before we know that people are actually find it worth the effort to look at them or generate them. Um, you know, what's the average hang length in the directory because it's a big hash? Object distribution across my stripes. Right? You can see that if, if we can get in with the monitoring and generate these, these more detailed logs that are customized, we can compute these kind of things. And this is the kind of stuff you need to know about in order to do any sort of optimization with your cache. Um, so that's a big deal. Um, so yeah, the solution is to, to do all of this and look at your, look at your cool stuff. And you, know, you could build some external tools. Haha, uh -huh, business idea, don't steal that, don't steal that. Um, so, um, related to this is what I'm calling annotation, although I'm sure no one else will call it that. People want better information about their cache contents. Now, we talked about doing it um, through log analysis. So you put a plug-in in, it monitors events, it generates logs, you analyze those, you figure out what's in it. So you, in that case, you're not looking at very real-time data, but you're more statistical time of thing. There are other people who want to know right now what is in my cache, and I want to know it fast. And some people have lots and lots of RAM. So we talked earlier about how the traffic server uh, index is very small, it's very small objects, you can have these huge, huge caches. And that's generally useful, but some people have so much memory, they'd rather spend the bytes and have more detail about what's actually in the cache. So we'd like to be able to do that without making everybody pay that RAM price, right? Because then we would have a serious problem. So what you can do is you can use the same monitoring to go and um, put this data off 
And you could actually build your own structures in memory to track what are the actual objects out there uh, and put that data on the side. Oh, okay, so we don't have that. Um, and, you know, I've, I've talked to people who said, yeah, I'll spend 10 gigabytes of RAM to know that. Um, or 20 gig, you know, whatever. I just need to know this kind of stuff. And that's exactly the kind of thing we want to make optional so we don't make everyone say, well, you've got to have 30, you know, 64 gig of RAM to run traffic server. That's not going to fly. So that's a big deal there. Um, and then the original problem we were actually intending to start out to solve, which is tiered storage. Um, so this is, I've got different types of storage media out there. And I want to be careful about which objects I put on which media. And I want to do migration between the media, right? So what we can do is we can create volumes based on storage type. And then we do our stripe assignment based on um, various criteria about what what the object is and what type of media we're going to put it on. This is where the parallel write comes from. So um, one of the, the views was that, well, when I write it, I don't care. I just write it to every stripe in parallel. And then when I migrate it out of the fastest storage, I just delete it off of there, and then I'll fall back to the other storage. And um, also, you probably do, you might well do the sequential reads here. So I'll read the fast stor fastest storage, and if I don't find it there, then I'll read the second fastest, and then I'll go to the, the, tier, the uh, slow, slowest one, right? And if your fast is really fast, it's actually more efficient just to try it. You know, if it's a, if it's a RAM stripe, it's not going to get faster, right? You, could just, you just try it, you find it, it's not there, you just move on. Um, so this is a big deal. There's a lot of people who want to do tiered storage um, to control, control that. Um, so you can use multiple write. Um, so deleting objects is a no I.O., because you just remove the directory entry, and then as far as the cache is concerned, the object isn't there. We can still copy, um, and you can search the tiers, and you can change between serial and parallel searches as you go down the tiers if you want. Okay, another thing that comes up that we can do is persistence control. So the traffic server cache, the content is a, is a circular buffer, right? So when an object gets written, its lifetime is not determined just by the expiration date, but by when the right cursor comes around. And if you have a very busy cache with lots of objects coming in, that lifetime can be significantly shorter than you want for those objects. Um, and people who value in the cache tend, tend to have objects they want to stay in cache for a long time. You could do the evacuation. We've looked at that. But then you're, you can really kill your stripe because you're copying gigabytes of data around your disk all the time. And that, then you're, you're just, your system just dies. So one of the things we're looking at is you say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segregate my content by my persist, expected persistence. So I'm going to have some stripes out here where I only put big, large, long-lived objects. And I'm going to have a stripe over there where I put all my transient crushed, right? If it's not a, it's not a big, long-lived object, it goes around those other stripes. So then your cache wraps on your persistent stripes happen much less frequently. And all of that storage is devoted to things you want to keep out there. And you have your other stripes for stuff that you don't care much about um, and that you don't care if it gets wrapped more often. So, and then you can always fail over. You can say, well, I'll move from long-term storage uh, to short-term storage if I want, or I can just delete it. Um, potentially, um, I, got, I got some negative feedback on this, I'll tell you. Um, it's, theoretically, you could do generational garbage collection. You'd have two stripes, and you generation garbage collect between them. Um, I thought that was really cool. Um, no one else did. So I don't see that happening, but you could do it. Okay. Um, Cache key flexibility. This is something that, that comes up. So we already talked about in the current API, you can tweak around the cache key. But you're still committed to say, OK, for this object, this is the cache key I'm going to use, and it works or it doesn't. But a lot of people out there would like to have more flexibility to say, well, I'm going to try this, but maybe it's in this other, under this other cache key. Um, you know, different host names, different um, parameters, different um, extensions. So what you can do is you can say, if we get a miss, we'll retry the read. Um, with a different cache key. And so you have a lot more flexibility if you, if, if you want to do that. And you could do it in parallel, too. You could say, well, I know it, it could have been this cache key or that cache key. So I'll just start two parallel reads out there and see which one works. Um, this is potentially useful for uh, alternates. If you don't have too many alternates, you could just store them each as an individual object and just parallel read out there to see which one you get. Um, that doesn't scale to a very large number of alternates, though, because you don't want to start 1,000 reads every time you get a, a client request in. Um, so you can try, you know, and this can, you can try this on different stripes or on different cache keys or both if you want. 
Another thing that comes up that uh, was brought up to me was large hot objects. So you have some large object you've stuck in your cache and you expect tomorrow at midnight for some unexplained reason, two million people are going to download it. Um, and so that's, that can be really nasty and you can blow your disk because it's just getting, you know, it can just get pounded even if, it's, if, it's in, if you can't fit it into RAM cache very easily. Um, so uh, one thing you could do is you, if you have that expectation, you could write it to multiple stripes and say, well, then I'll, I'll, when I get the stripe assignment and I notice I want to five stripes and I'll, I'll round robin through those so that I don't, not pounding just one disk and blocking everything else on that disk. And in fact, if we do the cache initiating cache reference, you could say, oh, this thing's getting hit a lot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy it over to a couple other stripes and then start serving it from there too. So you could do that dynamically if you wanted. Um, so this was this is this is an actual user request. I said I want to do this. Um, how much time do I have? Ooh, I gotta keep moving here. Um, export. This is a big deal. If, once you put value in your cache, you might want to be able to export pieces of it or all of it to store it someplace else. You can you can do things with it. Um, the current the current stuff you can kind of do, but because you can't look at the metadata effectively, it's, it's, it's more difficult than it should be, and you have to do the whole volume at once. Um, we'd like to be able to do export on Stripe or be able to do other, um, look at other properties of the, the metadata to decide if we want to export it. Um, currently, you could import without any additional code changes because you could just um, do a, a put, or you could set up an HTTPD server in front of your files and just request them all to get them cached in. Um, but we'd like to make the import easier so you can do it more dynamically. So you can do it, you have a plugin where you can talk to that you could put stuff into the cache more easily. This comes up. This is going to actually be done now. Um, people want to do cache cleaning. Um, most often this is for legal reasons. Someone said you, you're not allowed to have that thing in your cache. You have to get rid of it. So um, you can do that. You can kind of do this now with, with deletes. Again, with people what people want is more plug-in oriented so they have more flexibility about reaching in there, looking at the object and deciding if they want to delete it or not. So that's kind of a minor one. Um, all right, that's most of my talk. Any questions so far? What's going to happen to like syncing APIs that we've got to like authenticated? Are they going to be really useful? Because there weren't that useful for even writing HTTP cache requests. Yeah, um, I'm still looking at that. Currently, we'll probably leave them there. Um, I'd like to, if possible, integrate them into this API. There's the um, I have another slide that's going to touch on that a little bit because it's the what do we do with the frag value issue, right? If you're writing non HTTP objects, then that's that's more important. But the new APIs will allow me to write a plugin that will even write HTTP objects. Yes. So you'll be able you'll be able to get a hold of the the response and all the all the metadata and look at that. Um, what's the current state of development? I've done some prototyping of these features. Uh, it, there was a learning experience, although I don't think I'm going to bring that code forward, but um, I couldn't have done this design without trying that. Um, as you can see, I've got the design mostly finalized. Um, but so far, the response from community has been generally positive, except for the garbage collection thing. Um, we've got funding for this. I want to thank Comcast for uh, bringing this far enough and uh, helping to uh, move it forward from that. So I'll be starting work on this in the very near future. I'm getting a lot of push um, to get this done, to get this working. A lot, a lot of people want this. Um, and this is a speculative feature I want to just mention for the hardcore developers here is, is the fragment type. Currently, we, when we store objects in the cache, there's a fragment type value. And fundamentally, right now, it's not really used. It's just HTTP. Um, when we used to store FTP and Gopher and, and links and all that kind of stuff, it mattered. Um, so we're looking at reusing that to do per object versioning. So right now the version, the format version is stored per stripe. We'd like to be able to put that on an object so we get more backwards compatibility. Um, that's a big deal. There's people, we have value in your cache, you don't want to change, you know, uh, when we get a new version of ATS, you don't want to blow away your cache to upgrade. You'd like to be able to keep using the old cache at least for a while. Um, so what we might want to do is be able to have callbacks here to say, well, if it's this value for that version, call back this plugin to interpret the metadata for me. That would make backwards compatibility easier using that mechanism. But if we could also make it available to plugins, 
that might potentially be useful. I want to. I don't know how, I mean, I'm not sure how useful this, this would be driven primarily for the backwards compatibility purpose to make that more general so we don't have, I got complaints that I don't want to have 15 functions to read, you know, versions back to X, Y, Z kind of stuff. Um, this would let me, if I could do this, then I could do that, you know, they'd just plug in and just say, and they're much more easily removed or put back in. Um, but if we're going to write non-HTTP object slave, then we might still need that fragment value. So that's something we'll have to, to look at. All right, that's pretty much the end of my talk. As always, I talk about the resources. Um, we've got online documentation, bug tracker, IRC, yada, yada, yada. We've got expensive consulting services from me. Um, but again, always, it's always your best option because this Apache project is get involved in the community, very active, very friendly community. This is certainly where you want to start if you want to get involved in traffic server. Read a little bit of the docs, talk to the community. That's the people you want to who can make it make the project work for you. All right, I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>